Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship here this morning at Medford United Methodist Church. It's the third Sunday of Easter, and my name is Joe Monahan. I'm the senior pastor here on behalf of our associate pastor, Rachel Callender, the staff, the congregation. Welcome to worship. It's good to see you this morning. Take some time, uh, share the stream, let people know where you worship. Also, I hope that you will uh, let us know that you've been here, and you can do that at medfordumc.org slash online dash attendance or through our app. If you haven't downloaded the app, real easy to do, text the word Medford app, all one word, to 77977. And I'd encourage you finally uh, to take some time, think about making a gift to support our ministry uh, during this hour of worship or after. And you can do that at medfordumc.org slash give or again through our app. A couple of announcements as we get started. First of all, as uh, people continue to get vaccinated here in New Jersey, we are looking forward to implementing some of our reopening plans. And the first step in that is to reopen the church uh, for small group meetings. And we're going to be doing that in the month of May. So at the end of uh, this coming week, small group leaders are gonna be receiving an email talking about training that's gonna be required for them in order to uh, be able to be familiar with the policies and procedures that we're gonna put in place for small groups meeting here in the church. And then in the coming weeks, uh, if you are part of a small group, you will be invited uh, to come and join if your group so chooses uh, to be part of a small group meeting here at the church. And so we look forward to that uh, development. It's a hopeful step along the way as we move toward uh, fuller reopening. I want to share some news from the United Methodist Women and some of their mission initiatives. This week, uh, over the next couple weeks actually, they have some real easy ways for you to support uh, the United Methodist Women in uh, mission projects. And the first one is a Dining for Dollars at Ileano's, and that's happening uh, this coming week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. All you have to do is either dine in or take out, mention United Methodist, the Medford United Methodist Church, and they will donate $2.50 per entree, and that is going to be going towards uh, the Family Promise Initiative, which is an organization that we partner with in order to help people who are in need of housing here in Burlington County. So we're looking forward to that. Also, the United Methodist Women want you to know that they have a flower sale planned, and that's happening uh, just in time for Mother's Day. Actually, pre-orders will start coming on Monday, and you can do that through our website at medfordumc.org. And those uh, proceeds will benefit the Maker's Place in Trenton, one of our United Methodist Mission Partners, as well as Urban Promise in Camden. So today we are continuing with stories about the resurrection, talking about how the resurrection affected different people and how it affects us. And today we're looking at 1 Corinthians 15, we're looking at how the resurrection affected Paul. And so as we enter into that uh, space where we're thinking about that, I'd encourage you to take a moment to be in silent prayer and then join me in this prayer. Let's pray together. God of love and power, we gather this morning in need of hope. We gather this morning in need of restoration. We gather this morning in need of resurrection. Lord Jesus, this morning let us hear once more from the witnesses to your resurrection that we too might come to believe and trust that no matter what endings we face, with you new beginnings are possible. Amen.
Good morning. I'm so happy you're here with us for another children's moment. I'm going to begin by showing you the lid of our recycling can. And so you can see here my daughter, Abby, she has uh, designed a very nice sign for the lid with a nicely decorated lettering um, that says recycling and then our recycling logo. And that way we know how, where the glass and plastic bottles, the cans, the cardboard, the newspaper all goes. And I'm sure you all have a recycling can similar to this or maybe something different, but you all have a place where you recycle your items. And we do this because those are the items that can be used again. And I thought it was a great thing to highlight today since this week ahead we'll be celebrating Earth Day and all the ways that we can take care of the earth and recycling is one of those. So I've brought a little example of recycling with me today. This was an empty tuna fish can. And you know, tuna fish is super stinky. We took the tuna out, made it tuna salad and had a really yummy um, lunch rinsed at the can and threw it in the recycling bucket. But I took it out, it was still kind of stinky, washed it with some soap, and now I've got it nicely painted and decorated with these heart foam hearts and gems. And now it's a candy dish. I've created a nice, fun little candy dish. And maybe after I'm done using it as a candy dish, I can give it to someone special as a little present. I recycled something that was of no use and rather unpleasant, unpleasant in an attract, into an attractive, usable item. So I imagine you're wondering what this has to do with today's lesson. Well, let's see if we can figure it out together. So in our Bible story today, the Apostle Paul, an apostle is the word that what what we started calling those that were disciples. So the followers of Jesus became the apostles and the apostle Paul was going out to the people at Corinth. And he said this to those people, I'm the least important of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I harassed God's church. I am what I am by God's grace, and God's grace hasn't been for nothing. So Paul tells us that before he became a Christian, he mistreated others and did something, some bad things. And I think maybe Paul was mad at God and, and mad at the people that decided to follow God's ways. So when Paul accepted God's love, he received God's forgiveness. God's forgiveness, or we also can call that grace, is offered to people who don't deserve it. Don't you think this is a good example about how people can be recycled? God's forgiveness recycled Paul into a person of great usefulness, a person who was willing and able to share God's love with others. This is a good thing to remember if we find we've made a bad choice especially maybe hurt another person, when this happens, we can ask to be forgiven and find a way to make something useful out of our bad actions. God recycles us with forgiveness and we can use that forgiveness to make something of value. Our scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 15, words from the Apostle Paul in the CEB translation. Brothers and sisters, I want to call your attention to the good news that I preached to you, which you also received and in which you stand. You are being saved through it if you hold on to the message I preach to you, unless somehow you have come to believe in vain. I passed on to you as most important what I also received. Christ died for our sins in line with the scriptures. He was buried and he rose on the third day in line with the scriptures. He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. 
And then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time. Most of them are still alive to this day, although some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me, as if I were born at the wrong time. I'm the least important of the apostles. I don't deserve to be called an apostle because I harassed God's church. I am what I am by God's grace, and God's grace hasn't been for nothing. In fact, I have worked harder than all the others. That is, it wasn't me, but the grace of God that is with me. So then, whether you heard the message from me or them, this is what we preach, and this is what you have believed. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, we give you thanks for the gift of the scriptures. We give you thanks for your resurrection and for the power that it brings into our lives. We pray this morning that we might hear your good news, that we might take it to heart, and that we might bear witness to it as we go forth into the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are gathered in the season of Easter, a people desperate, desperately in need of resurrection. This week, I found myself overwhelmed by the news. Even as the trial and the killing of George Floyd unfolded, we heard about the shooting of Dante Wright in another Minneapolis suburb. Then on Friday, we saw a video of Adam Toledo, a 13-year-old boy shot in Chicago. I'm heartbroken for these families, for their communities, and for the nation. I'm heartbroken for good cops and their loved ones who worry that they will become targets. I'm heartbroken for people of color who already feel like targets and who continue to ask white Americans, what's it going to take for you to see this? What's it going to take for you to own this? And what's it going to take for you to change this? And all of it is happening against a backdrop of another mass shooting the 46th in the past month, this one at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. Meanwhile, COVID-19 deaths in the U.S. stand at 566,000, with more than 3 million worldwide. We are a people in desperate need of resurrection. And so when we talk about these things, whether we're talking about gun violence, whether we're talking about racial justice, whether we're talking about a global pandemic, the warming planet. Despair seems to be our default position, and that's understandable. It's also easy, and it's profoundly unhelpful. Despair has never solved a problem. Despair might be a necessary stage of grief we experience on the way to solving a problem, but it's it's never going to solve a problem. In this season of Easter, despair leaves us stuck at the cross on Good Friday. It leaves us sitting outside the tomb on Saturday weeping. Easter Sunday is come and gone. So where's the resurrection we were promised? Where's the resurrection we so desperately need? Our despair and this feeling of being overwhelmed, it's understandable in the face of such daunting problems. You know, we probably wouldn't be human if we didn't feel it some days. We probably wouldn't be in touch with any shred of compassion or empathy if the despair never crept into us. But that just can't be the whole story. Because the reality is that Easter Sunday has come and gone. Because the reality is that Christ is risen. And now what he needs are some witnesses to the resurrection. Now I know that none of us feels like we have it in us. I know that I don't feel like I have it in me right now. But I know what I believe. I believe in a God of resurrection. 
I believe that even when everything feels overwhelming, God is still at work because we can still be at work with and for God. And what I really want to talk about today, the ministry Jesus has given us. That's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the ministry that Jesus has given us as those who can bear witness to the resurrection. You know, 1 Corinthians 15, this passage that we read this morning, is one of my favorite passages, and here's why. To read this passage is, for me, the most direct link to the Easter faith. It's a connection that even the gospel accounts of Easter don't match in my mind. Because here, Paul catalogs a whole list of witnesses to the resurrection. Witnesses who went on to turn the world absolutely upside down. Including an appearance that Jesus made to more than 500 people at one time. You know, whenever I feel like I'm crazy for having hope in the face of despair, I ponder these verses. I consider the lives of those who have testified to the power of the resurrection, however imperfectly, right up to today. I think about the preachers and the pastors and just the everyday people who have inspired me to trust in this God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. This God who is able to secure a victory at precisely the moment when everything seems lost. When I think about how often in my life I've needed that kind of hope and where I'd be without it, I'm profoundly grateful to them. Those witnesses to the resurrection have meant everything to me. You know, one of the surprising details of this passage are the particular names listed among the witnesses. Because first there's Peter. Peter here referred to as Cephas. That's Peter in Aramaic. That was the everyday language that Jesus spoke. Now, Peter is the prototype for all of us who try our best who desperately want to be strong in our faith, who want to live out our hope, but who keep failing in all the key moments. Remember, it was Peter who abandoned and denied Jesus, not just once, but three times. Did Peter despair at the situation that he found himself in? Well, absolutely. Imagine for a second following Jesus for three years, watching him work miracle after miracle, and knowing his power, Then imagine watching him arrested and humiliated and crucified. It was all just too much. Despair probably isn't even a strong enough word for what Peter felt. Is it any wonder he failed Jesus? Or take James. James was Jesus' own brother, and yet the Gospels make it clear that he didn't believe. He didn't believe, like, at all. Mark says that the family thought Jesus was out of his mind and even tried to put an end to Jesus' ministry to restrain him, to keep him at home, to keep him from preaching. James is the prototype of that cynic that lives in all of us and says, yeah, right. You know, when you look at every person who tries to convince you that this or that will make a difference in the situation and you just say, I don't see it. It won't work. It can't work. It can't happen. It can't change. This will never change. James, he looked at his brother, whom he surely sat across the table from many times, and said, him, this guy, really? How many times does our cynicism keep us locked in despair because we refuse to believe that resurrection is even possible? But beyond Peter or James, There's one more person to consider in this list. There's Paul. You know, Paul wasn't just mired in despair. He wasn't just having a hard time believing in the resurrection. He was actively working to resist the resurrection, to invalidate it by destroying all the witnesses to it. The scriptures say that Paul began as the church's foremost opponent, persecuting believers to the point even of overseeing their executions. That is, until he met the risen Jesus. Paul is the prototype of all of us who are actually part of the problem. We who want to deny that we are part of the problem, who can't see that we are part of the problem, but who are nonetheless part of the problem. 
and I count myself among them. Whether by action or inaction, by our failure to stand up, by letting comments slide, by being okay with injustice when it either doesn't affect us or in fact benefits us in some way, we actively contribute to others' despair. You know, it's hard to be a witness to the resurrection until you've experienced new life in Christ for yourself. It's hard to want to share hope with others when you're locked in your own way as opposed to God's way of looking at the world. We are a people in desperate need of resurrection. And here's the reality. The reality that the church has proclaimed throughout its history. The resurrection happened. Easter was two weeks and 2,000 years ago. And so now what Jesus needs are some witnesses who can testify to it. Witnesses to the power of God at work in the world. Power that can bring about new life and new possibilities where all that we see is hopelessness and despair. To witness to the resurrection is to take part in Christ's work. It's to own a piece of his ministry, the same ministry that he first gave to the twelve, and that has come down through the generations from one person to another, each bearing witness until we, ourselves, we finally heard the story. How is it that Paul says it? He says, I passed on to you as most important what I also received. What the world needs is for the church to take on this ministry of witnessing to the resurrection. It's vitally important because what it means is that we are empowered and engaged when other people are withdrawing and shaking their heads and saying, what can be done? What can be done? We can't allow ourselves or the world around us to be trapped in despair. Not when God has given us the best news that anyone anywhere has ever heard. Now, you may not feel up to this. You may not feel worthy of this. But Christ has given us, you and me, Christ has given us this work, even though we are far from perfect witnesses. And when you start to think about how imperfect a witness you are, then remember Peter. Then remember James, then remember Paul. All of us at one time or another find ourselves stuck in despair. We find ourselves just as cynical as can be. And yes, sometimes in fact, we are part of the problem. And yet, Christ still appeared to them, still appeared to Peter and to James and to Paul, and he still asked them to bear witness to his resurrection. So this week, you may find yourself in despair. You may cynically question whether anything you can do will ever make a difference. You may even come to realize that you're part of the problem. You may say to yourself, I don't have a lot to offer. But still, you're called to bear witness to the resurrection. Can you tell a story of God's power at work when you felt like you had lost hope? If you are here this morning, I'm guessing it's because God has done or is doing something in you or for you or with you. And I know sometimes it's hard to hold on to that. It's hard to keep that in your view. Sometimes we just get overwhelmed and we get exhausted. Sometimes we despair in the face of the world's problems. And you know what? Over the short term, that's okay. It's understandable. But despair has never solved any problem anyone anywhere has ever had. Something different is required for that. And those are the moments when we need to remember that the resurrection we so desperately need has already happened. And we need to know that what Jesus needs for us and from us now is to be faithful even if imperfect witnesses, so that we can tell the story of how God's power makes a way, even when it seems that there is no way. We are a people in need of a resurrection. So why don't we go and tell the story of how it's already happened? Go and tell the story of God's power at work. Bear witness to it this week, however imperfectly you do. Go forth 
to bear witness to it this week. Amen. Friends, a few weeks ago, we announced an initiative to raise some money in order to help enhance our video ministry, not only uh, during the spring as we look to live stream some services from outside, but also uh, as we assess the shape of our post-pandemic. Friends, a few weeks ago, we announced an initiative to raise some money in order to help enhance our video ministry, not only uh, during the spring as we look to live stream some services from outside, but also uh, as we assess the shape of our post-pandemic ministry and continue to think about how we can use video to enhance the way that we share the gospel here in Medford and also around the world uh, through our website, through Facebook. We are really grateful for the support that we've received so far. We are halfway there. Um, we've received $7,550 so far, and we're looking forward to uh, closing the gap to our $15,000 goal. And so if you'd like to support us in that, or if you'd like to make a gift to support the ministry of the church as a whole, there are several ways you can do that. You can go to our website at medfordumc.org give. You can visit us uh, through our app and make a gift there. You can send a text, Medford Give, all one word, to 77977 and get a secure text link. Or you can mail a check to the church at Medford United Methodist Church, 2 Hartford Road, Medford, New Jersey, 08055. If you'd like to make a gift to the video ministry, make sure to mark your check accordingly. We thank you for your support of the video ministry. We thank you for your support of our ministry as a whole. We are grateful for the ways in which you are making a difference uh, through your generosity. God bless you and thank you.
as we come together in prayer this morning, I invite you to share any prayers of joy or even of sorrow that you may have weighing on your heart this morning in the chat, but please use first names only. Let us pray. Risen Savior, you who intricately created each and every flower, you who intricately created each one of us in your glorious image, we give thanks to you today for beautiful spring days, for vaccines, we give thanks to you for fellowship, we give thanks to you for joy and laughter and smiling. Holy God, we pray that you be with each one of us as we continue through the spring season, as we continue through the season after Easter, looking towards Pentecost, looking towards the summer, and that you fill us with your Holy Spirit each and every day and center our lives around your glorious, glorious world. Holy God, may your grace just exude from us. We pray this day that you will be with each one of us who are experiencing any sort of sorrow and each one of us in our thanksgivings and in our beautiful joy. We pray all this in the way that your son Jesus Christ taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, we thank you so much for joining us in worship today. As you go forth from this place, as you go forth from your car, from your couch, uh, from your living room, from uh, just rolling out of bed this morning, wherever you go forth from, go forth in the power of the resurrection. Go forth knowing that whatever circumstances you face, that you are not alone and that God stands behind you, that God goes before you and that Jesus walks beside you. Go forth believing in the power of the resurrection. Amen. I raise a hallelujah of my enemies I raise a hallelujah louder than 
than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a Heaven comes to fight for 